the Appalachian Mountain Club's Director of Research, as he mentioned. I joined AMC last September after being at the University of Maine. Um, and I was really thrilled to make the move to AMC, uh, where the places that we work to conserve include protected areas where my research has largely focused. Um, and I'm, so by trade, I'm a geochemist. Uh, and I spend most of my time working on research about how air and water pollution affect places that we think should be pristine, like parks, mountain ecosystems, and forests. Um, so here are the landscapes stretching right down into Northern Virginia, uh, where we bring AMC's suite of skills in conservation, including research and science, trail planning, stewardship, and policy and advocacy. Um, so our air and water science and monitoring is really mission related, like all of our research work. Uh, we work to understand the resources we're trying to protect, learn about our natural world, and, and do applied science to support and inform our conservation policies, as well as sharing knowledge and educating the members and visitors of AMC. Um, and so a lot of that mission is really shared by the Dragonfly Mercury Project, which I'll talk about uh, for the rest of the time. And I'm gonna cover a lot of ground kind of quickly, but I'll pause for questions a couple of times throughout the talk. Um, so pictured here is our DMP, Dragonfly Mercury Project team, which includes uh, Colleen Flanagan Pritz from the National Park Service, Colin Eagle Smith and others from the US Geological Survey, um, and Celia Chen at Dartmouth College. Um, and so again, uh, this core team, uh, we all joined forces in the early days of the project um, and wrote a proposal to a US Geological Survey National Park Service combined grant program um, to expand the geography uh, and the science of the Dragonfly Mercury Project, which, which began, as I mentioned, as kind of a focused piece in some main schools. Um, and in bringing in all of these colleagues from US Geological Survey, we were able to really dive deep into the water chemistry, some work with sediments, and food web interactions that I'll talk about today and fully implement this project across the US. Um, so this is an example of a project that uh, is really involved and, and we're now beginning to start thinking about expanding beyond parks um, and have been working in New Hampshire now with engaging with some other schools as well as the US Forest Service this year. Um, so I'll start off with a, a quick overview of mercury. Um, it's a chemical element on the periodic table. Uh, it's the only metal that's liquid at room temperature. And if you're old enough like me to have been around from some of the earliest decades of Earth Day, uh, several decades ago, you might have broken a mercury thermometer and seen the drops of silver metal run around on the floor. Uh, quick note, you don't wanna do this. Mercury is considered hazardous waste. So my public service announcement is if you have any mercury containing items like old thermometers or uh, fluorescent light bulbs, uh, be sure to look up where you can dispose of them properly, um, which is not in your household trash can. Um, so mercury is a toxic pollutant that harms human and wildlife health. Um, and it's a neurotoxin, meaning it affects the brain uh, as well as other potential effects. Um, and interestingly, on the, on the history note, the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland is actually a reference to mercury. So uh, back a couple centuries ago in the process of felting wool, mercury was actually used in that process. So people who made wool hats uh, had a lot of exposure to mercury and, and went quite mad. Um, so kind of a fun historic tidbit, tidbit there. Uh, so uh, these days we don't really care about mercury because we're all making felted wool hats, um, but more uh, these days because you are what you eat or in scientific terms, we worry about mercury because it bioaccumulates in the tissues of animals and biomagnifies or is passed up the food chain. So it increases at every step in the food web, in the food chain. So by the time we get to upper level predators like fish eating birds uh, and large fish and people, uh, we have mercury that's 1 million to 10 million times more concentrated than what was originally deposited in a watershed. Uh, and I'll walk through some of that in a moment. 
Um, and so because of mercury contamination and its biomagnification, federal agencies issue fish consumption advisories, meaning that people from sensitive populations, including pregnant women and children uh, and women of, of uh, childbearing age should limit their intake of fish, particularly certain types of fish. Um, so this is uh, a recent poster um, with the advice from US EPA and FDA, the Food and Drug Administration regarding mercury. Um, and I should note some states have stricter uh, mercury um, uh, advisories as well as some tribes. Um, so um, we can jump into a brief look at that. So uh, it turns out that uh, mercury contamination is the leading cause of fish consumption advisories in North America. So all 50 states uh, do have a mercury fish consumption advisory. And in fact, they don't uh, issue this map anymore, um, probably because all of the states are now included. It was more relevant when some states did not have advisories yet. Um, the color coding here designates different types of advisories depending on whether they're coastal or all water bodies or specific water bodies, um, but all states do have some mercury fish advisories. And these advisories are really warranted. Uh, when we look at data from nationwide fish sampling, nearly half of all the lakes in the U.S. have fish with mercury concentrations of concern. Um, this is from a large EPA study. And from the U.S. Geological Survey, um, they looked at mercury and fish in streams across the country, and approximately one quarter of U.S. streams have fish with mercury concentrations of concern. Um, so that concern is warranted. Um, so at this point, everybody wants to know, well, where is this mercury coming from? Um, it, it has both anthropogenic or human-caused and natural geogenic sources. Um, and its cycle is almost as weird and complex as the life cycle of dragonflies, which I'll get to next. Um, it's produced from geological sources like volcanoes, uh, but in the U.S. and in the northeast U.S. where I am, eastern U.S. where you are, uh, we don't have too many active volcanoes these days. Um, so it's primarily deposited from the atmosphere in rain, snow, and dust, dry deposition, and about three quarters of the mercury that lands here in New England where I'm sitting uh, is from anthropogenic or human-caused sources. Uh, in the U.S., the single largest source um, has been um, human caused like coal fired utilities and burning of fossil fuels. Um, so we can see these anthropogenic sources of mercury in environmental records. Um, this is from a recent paper that put together the longest term picture yet of mercury sources, which we usually call emissions. Uh, and so this is mercury that moves from the Earth's surface to the atmosphere where it travels long distances, not unlike the smoke that we're seeing from Western wildfires um, kind of arriving in the east these days. Um, and it affects ecosystems that are remote from the source um, as well as near the sources. So mercury is indeed a global pollutant. Um, and this is one of my favorite uh, versions of, of a, a graphic showing some of the influences on that cycle. Um, it shows the results from an ice core extracted from the Fremont Glacier in Wyoming here in the US. Um, and so scientists often use cores of, that we drill of ice, peat, or sediment uh, from the bottoms of lakes as proxies. And they record what was deposited to the Earth's surface um, when we weren't around or able to measure. Um, so climate change science uses these same types of proxies to look at changes in uh, temperature um, and, and think about carbon throughout the centuries. Um, here we can see the baseline or the background, what they're calling pre-industrial mercury in the light yellow on the left of this graph. Uh, and as we go from the bottom to the top of the graph, we're going uh, through time. So from the year 1700 to about 2000. Um, and we can see short-term blips like volcanic eruptions, most recently Mount St. Helens. Um, 
And we noticed, though, how mercury returns to uh, kind of the normal pre-industrial level when some of these historic volcanoes occurred, like Krakatoa. Um, but notice how after the Industrial Revolution, the baseline has shifted. So after Mount St. Helens, um, that blip, we're not seeing mercury go back to the background level, but we've got these elevated anthropogenic levels. And that's part of the issue. So when re released to the biosphere, uh, mercury is really mobile and it can take a millennia to return to the long-term storage like those geological um, repositories. Um, and so kind of the old adage, um, what goes up must come down is as true as ever. Um, and I actually spent the first six years of my research career collecting deposition, the rain, snow, and dust deposition of mercury at Acadia National Park. So here's one from the vault from 1999. Um, and tracing that mercury from the air into watersheds in Acadia and looking at how it differed across space in across the park. Um, and so this graphic is here not for anyone to digest, um, but simply to demonstrate once mercury does make it into a watershed, it's deposited on the ground and on vegetation and on fresh waters, uh, it starts a really complicated cycle that is influenced at all levels by the landscape, by the ecology, and by the biology of fish and the other species that are that are taking it in. So it's really complicated and it varies across space a lot. Um, landscapes vary, uh, how water flows varies, and all of that factors into mercury. Um, so, so what we're doing with the Dragonfly Mercury Project um, is really uh, figuring out which water bodies are likely to be most vulnerable to mercury accumulating in its food webs. Um, and part of that has to do with uh, once mercury is in the water, an accidental transformation occurs uh, by bacteria that convert the mercury uh, into a more toxic form that can cross the cell wall and accumulate. Um, so even though we have a really good understanding of many of the steps in the process, figuring out which water bodies are most vulnerable to mercury accumulating uh, is still a huge challenge, and that's um, where we are beginning to uh, dig into this more with dragonfly larvae biosentinels. Um, so I'm going to pause for a moment to see if there are any questions uh, related to mercury sources and kind of the background uh, primer on mercury. Any clarifying questions before jumping ahead to dragonflies? Uh, so can you explain why mercury went up during the gold rush? Oh, that's a great question. Um, this is actually relevant today, though not so much in the U.S. So in gold mining, uh, and, and there's a term for this now, uh, ASGM, artisanal small-scale gold mining, the type of gold mining that would have occurred in the gold rush in the U.S. and that is now occurring in many um, countries around the world um, on continents like Africa and South America. Mercury really likes to stick to gold, so gold uh, is amalgamated or sort of collected up uh, using mercury as, as, um, as a substance that helps to, to capture that gold in gold mining. Um, so legacy mining sites tend to have higher mercury. Um, yeah. Okay. Are there any other biosentinel species besides dragonflies? That's a good question as well. Um, and certainly fish are, are sampled many states. Um, and researchers sample fish because it's really important to know how much mercury is in fish and get direct measurements of what people and wildlife are eating. Um, so in, in that sense, fish are biosentinels. I know there have been some researchers who have worked on uh, aquat uh, marine species like mussels to look at oceanic mercury. Um, so there certainly are other biosentinels. Okay, so we'll jump into dragonflies. Um, one thing about dragonflies that surprises most people, including me when I was first learning about them, is how long they can live in their aquatic stage as aquatic insects. Uh, some species have a very short aquatic phase. There are vernal pool specialists that have to develop into adults from the egg stage 
within weeks before the pool they're living in dries up. Um, but many um, overwinter and spend many years growing to the point where they're ready to crack out of their exoskeleton and fly away as adults. Uh, overall, they do spend most of their lives in the water as larvae, uh, eating other insects, tiny animals, and even fish or tadpoles, anything that they can fit in their voracious mouth parts. Um, so they live in the water again for several years, uh, up to eight or nine years for some species, and then they'll climb up onto a blade of grass or a rock or your dock if you happen to live on a lake, um, and crack that brown exoskeleton or exuvia uh, and fly away, and then they live for weeks to months. Um, so for the Dragonfly Mercury Project, we focus on the larvae, which are also called nymphs, um, bit of a philosophical question. Uh, so that stage where they're growing and living in the water. So uh, why are we using dragonfly larvae as biosentinels? Again, this, this long-lived um, life history in the water, they're accumulating mercury the whole time. And those aquatic ecosystems, freshwater streams, lakes, wetlands where they live, are one of the areas that's most conducive to that conversion to the more toxic form of mercury that bioaccumulates. Um, they're important prey for fish, so they are eaten by lots of things in the water. Uh, so they're part of that food web and, and thinking about how dragonfly larvae can influence the upper food web. Uh, they are a big part of that. Um, and logistically, they're actually quite easy to collect, uh, much easier than fish. Uh, permitting for collecting invertebrates, um, while we do have national park permits and some state permits are recommended or required. Uh, the level of permitting to collect them uh, is, is much simpler to, to deal with as scientists. And really importantly, they're large and easy to identify. Um, so once the citizen scientists who work on this project uh, get their dragonfly eyes on, as one of our teachers used to say, um, it's really a cinch to find them. Um, so we can sample a site in an hour or two. And actually I was finishing up field work last Friday at a site and we had all the samples we needed within about 20 minutes. It was a really productive site. Um, so uh, the other great thing about dragonfly larvae for this project is that they're ubiquitous um, in fresh waters and really plentiful. As I mentioned uh, last week, we were sampling in a you know, few feet um, square area of a lake and we had plenty of samples in in literally minutes. Um, they're on all continents except Antarctica and they live in every type of freshwater body from vernal pools to huge lakes. The Mississippi River is one of our sites. Ponds that don't have fish. Um, so if we were using fish as the only biosentinel for mercury and we were looking at say mountain ponds or vernal pools, that don't have fish, we wouldn't be able to estimate mercury. Um, so they provide us these estimates of mercury that we can compare directly uh, across the country and across all types of water bodies. Um, so here are some photos of places that uh, have been sampled for this project, just kind of showing the diversity of sites. Uh, we've been fortunate to sample in some really neat desert oases, uh, including in Joshua Tree, National Park, um, in wetlands, small to large, rivers, tiny streams, lakes, coast to coast, uh, and, and we're finding dragonfly larvae in all of these types of sites. Um, and so uh, we are doing this study currently in national parks. Um, and, and one of the questions is, uh, why are those the sites where we're sampling? Um, my now colleague for a decade, Colleen Flanagan Pritz from the National Park Service, was actually in Maine for a Mercury meeting um, was focused on Acadia many years ago and heard about the early incarnation of this project um, that I was working on with Scudic Institute at Acadia um, and partnered with Maine schools uh, to collect aquatic invertebrates for that project. And at lunch, she said, why aren't we doing this in parks? And honestly, that's the moment I think that this project was born. So mercury is important and the National Park Service thinks about it because it does threaten the wildlife and the ecosystems that the Park Service is charged to protect. And the citizen science aspect 
um, really meets another goal of the Park Service, connecting people to parks, getting people interested in biodiversity and protected ecosystems. Um, so uh, over the past 10 years and continuing in 2020 in a limited capacity given uh, the citizen science um, and COVID uh, implications, um, but over the past decade, we've assessed mercury in over 500 water bodies across more than 100 national park units um, from Alaska to Florida to Maine to Hawaii um, and other federal, state, and protected areas. Um, and this year, sampling is still in progress and even more sites have been added. So the goals of the project are really um, First, a scientific goal to increase our understanding of mercury contamination in National Park Service units across the U.S. using dragonfly larvae as biosentinels. Um, and so uh, here's a, a brief video of what the collection looks like. Um, we're out in the field. Normally there's a big group of citizen scientists doing this with all sorts of nets. Um, and you're essentially poking around in the habitat. Um, and that was a dragonfly larva uh, crawling around in her net there. Um, we, we pick them up. We usually put them in sort of a holding tank and decide which individuals um, we're going to send to the lab for sampling. We use 15 individuals per site. Um, so we can look across what we've caught and, and choose those samples. Um, they then are individually backed to reduce contamination and they go to the lab where they're dried um, and then ultimately uh, all the samples now are shipped to the U.S. Geological Survey lab in Oregon where they're analyzed for mercury on their instrumentation. It's a really straightforward and simple process. Um, and so our key scientific findings to date uh, have, and I'll go through these uh, with some figures and, and images in a minute, were to establish baseline data for mercury across all of the major ecoregions and most states in the U.S. Um, so many parks and frankly many places don't have mercury data unless someone has happened to do research there or uh, there's some state monitoring of some water bodies. So we really wanted to establish this baseline data. Uh, we also identified spatial patterns in mercury at the continental scale, uh, which uh, my colleagues have done for fish as well, and documented just how variable the concentrations are across water bodies. Um, so identifying that the spatial patterns at that large of a scale um, has not really been done previously, so it was, it was really good to establish that. Uh, and we also worked and dug in to develop the science around using dragonfly larvae as, as biosentinels for mercury. This hadn't been done before, uh, including linking their concentrations to fish and other critters uh, in the same water bodies. Um, and as Jim mentioned, a paper on this was just released in July, um, and we have the link to that to share in the chat because it's open access if you want to learn more. Um, all right, so uh, what are biosentinels? I've kind of been tossing that word around. Uh, I like to think of them as the proverbial canary in a coal mine. Um, so dra dragonfly larvae really amplify the signal that we've seen for mercury in regional and other studies uh, of site to site variability. And that really means that they're useful in lighting up the map and telling us where there are areas of higher or lower potential mercury risk. Um, this is really job number one for a biosentinel to tell us where should we look more? Where should we maybe go sample fish and figure out um, if this pond has high or low uh, mercury in, in fish or think about the wildlife in that location. Um, so uh, what we found in the study that was just released, this is one of the figures from that, is um, a lot of variability and you can see in these dots where going from blue all the way up to the kind of darker black color, we're going from relatively low uh, mercury risk to higher risk, um, that all across the country there were sites with low risk and high risk. Um, and some of the sites could be in really close proximity or even within the same national park and have a, a, a variation in that risk. Um, overall, only about 11% of the sites were in the 
highest risk category. Most were in the moderate to low risk, but there are places where we should be thinking about mercury. Um, so I pulled the data for the Virginia area, um, and we see that same type of variability um, in the Virginia area. Shenandoah has been sampled the longest in the Dragonfly Mercury Project, so we have several years of data, uh, but several other parks in the area have been part of the project, including a bunch in the Capital Region um, and battlefields like Appomattox Courthouse. Um, and so we see again that dragonfly larvae are really able to highlight variability. Uh, they're helping us understand the spatial puzzle in the differences from one bot water body to the next. So even within a park, um, we have seen variability up to 44 fold from the lowest to the highest mercury site. And that really helps us focus in again on on places to pay attention to mercury and maybe do some more research and monitoring. Um, and so they're doing a good job again at telling us which places warrant further study. Uh, and we hope in the future that resource manage managers will be able to work with us and use this type of information to um, again con conduct further science and really target their thinking about relative risk for wildlife and people. Uh, so um, one of the key steps, I kind of skipped something and jumping right into showing you those relative risk um, figures. One of the key steps here that we did in the, in the paper and in the study um, was uh, developing this relative impairment index. So Dr. Eagle Smith and his colleagues sampled fish and amphibians in many of the same lakes, streams, and wetlands as we also sampled dragonfly larvae. Um, so we were able to use the relationships developed uh, by pairing the fish and amphibian data with dragonflies um, to relate the dragonfly larvae concentrations to those in fish, frogs, and salamanders, then compare those translated values um, to known benchmarks or thresholds um, that cause, for example, reproductive issues for fish. And now we were able to take the concentrations we found in dragonfly larvae and index them to what we would expect for fish in that same water body um, and what impairments those fish or, or their predators would potentially be subject to uh, given those concentrations in dragonflies. So it lets us link up through the food web um, as, and statistically turn dragonflies into fish. Uh, to estimate how they might be impaired themselves or pose risk to other critters that are potentially eating them. Okay, so I'll pause there and see if there are any questions on the dragonfly biosentinels or relative mercury risk pieces before we get to the citizen science. Okay, so we do have a couple questions here in the chat. Uh, the larvae, do they breathe the surface or the do they extract oxygen from the water directly? That's a great question. They have gills, so um, they're, they're aquatic um, and extracting from the water. Yep. Okay. Uh, so for the sites where you have multiple years of data, are you seeing significant changes from year to year? Also a great question, and we're just beginning to dig into some of that. Um, and for some, some sites have been part of the project long term uh, for the entire 10 years, but we really began with a very small pilot set of data. So most sites have only participated um, for a few years at a time. Um, and one of the things we're hoping to do in the future is use this baseline data set over the very long term, which in long term monitoring, um, I also work on these uh, lakes that have been sampled to look at uh, reductions in acidity related to the Clean Air Act amendments and, and decades of data are generally needed. So we're hoping that over the decadal timescale, we would be able to see um, any reductions or changes in mercury from emissions uh, year to year in, in a, at least one site we've looked at, um, there weren't uh, big changes within that one site. Um, but again, we haven't dug into that very much yet. Um, and that's a hope for the future. Some more research going forward. 
Okay, uh, got one or two more here. Uh, so when your sample teams go out, how long do they collect for? Do they just collect for a day or so, or do they collect over a series of days? Yep, that's a great question. So at each site, at each individual, say lake or wetland, um, normally the team is only out there and collecting in the water for uh, an average of an hour, maybe two hours. A lot of times if you have a big group of kids, they don't want to get out of the water. So uh, we can spend more time there sometimes than it actually takes. Um, but yes, we go out um, for each site generally one time um, to collect for, again, an hour or two. Um, these are national parks. So if people aren't finding sufficient samples within an hour at the most, we tell them to, um, to, to just let us know that that site wasn't productive at that time. And sometimes people will go back at a later time. There could have been a group of dragonflies that were all on the same, same time scale and sort of emerged and flew away. And the next cohort isn't quite developed enough yet to be caught in our nets. Um, but yeah, one sampling event per water body, and it's usually a matter of hours. Okay, one more. Uh, so are you testing just specifically dragonfly larvae or are you getting damselflies also? Just dragonfly larvae. Uh, damselflies, we will find them at many of the sites. Their body size is much smaller, which um, gives us less material to analyze and uh, can be make that a little bit of a challenge when you have a very small amount of material to analyze. Um, but yeah, just dragonflies. All right, um, so uh, a second big goal of the DMP is to engage citizen scientists in the work, um, really fostering public participation in scientific research. Um, honestly, we could not get this project done without citizen scientists. Um, and yes, we're scientists and we love talking about the data, but this project really ignites a passion for field research, for biodiversity, and for the outdoors in citizen scientists and, and keeps us going. Um, so the key to success for the DMP has been engagement of citizens. Um, they're the ones who actually do the work sampling and collecting and submitting the dragonfly samples. Um, so uh, the project also has a wonderful photo library of people who have collected and the sites they've collected throughout the years. Uh, we have this huge army of over 4,500 participants through the years. Um, and that has allowed us to cover the entire country and gain a national scale picture of Mercury. Um, so just three scientists working part-time on the project might have been able to sample a handful of sites in a couple of regions, uh, but the community of participants is what really makes it work at this scale. Um, so here are some of those great photos of park leaders and citizens sampling dragonflies from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Northwest to northern New Hampshire, where I sit now. Um, and one of the key features of the project is we um, have a, a person within the park, either a park service employee or sometimes a local teacher working with the park, who is the champion of the project and is our primary contact. And we work to train them in the methodology and communicate regularly with them. They choose the citizen science group that they want to take in the field. Maybe it's a group they've worked with before. Maybe it's a group they wanted to engage with. Um, and, and they set up the details of the sampling day and uh, consult with us on the sites. Um, and they lead the effort, uh, which has been a really nice approach. Um, and it's an extra bonus, like in this park a couple of years ago, Capitol Reef, when the citizen group happens to be a college photography class. We got a lot of great photos from that one. Um, and the photos from all over the country are really remarkable and inspiring. And we see uh, kids and adults and volunteers in parks who are often retired people out there just having a great time with smiles on their faces sampling. Um, and we recently contributed to a paper um, by the Park Service, uh, by Park Service authors about citizen science in national parks uh, with the title Science in Places of Grandeur. Um, and that title really captures it. I think everyone is um, enthralled with not just the dragonflies, but also these wonderful places we get to go. Um, so the green wheel graph here provides a picture of 
the huge contributions of, of the citizen scientists. Uh, most of the groups are, high, are school groups. Uh, high school and some middle schools tend to be the, the most of the participants. Um, but a good portion are local volunteers, watershed groups, scouts, um, and local youth programs. Um, so the project is really neat in that it's connecting people uh, with the parks that they live near, that are in their communities or, or pretty close by. Um, and I think sometimes when I think of national parks, I think of visitors coming from far away to a park. Um, but this was really neat when we rolled up the data um, and could see that um, a lot of the folks that are participating are actually right in the community of parks and getting involved in, in, in their backyard. Um, so exciting um, and this year we analyzed the data about uh, dragonfly identification so one of the things that folks who participate and some of the park staff who may not be entomologists are concerned about is will they be able to identify the larvae to the family level we asked them to identify uh, the dragonflies to the family level there are really six families um, in the U.S. that are likely to be found in these sites. Uh, and we provide, um, we have a video key and uh, cards that show the different families and their identifying features. And folks always want to know, did I identify my dragonflies to family correctly? Uh, we re-identify them in the lab um, to confirm, uh, but it's best if they're identified in the field in case something happens in shipping uh, or in the, in the processing before analysis. Um, and it turns out that uh, citizen scientists are, are doing a really good job. They get a B plus to an A minus for identifying dragonfly larvae to ID, uh, even with really minimal training and, and just being out in the field um, that one day for a site. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Citizens can really do a great job um, and uh, we're providing new tools and, and guidance this year because we can tell which families tend to be um, confused with each other. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting to see that. Um, yeah, and so here's one of my favorite sampling outings. We have had a Girl Scout troop sample in Women's Rights National Historical Park, uh, which, is, which is a nice fitting location for them. Uh, we've had outdoor adventure programs, um, sample on a whitewater trip in the Grand Canyon, which I wish I had been able to go on that one, uh, and kids in the local community at Denali. Um, and the data that they're helping to produce is really used. They form our core database, which is quality assured and released officially by the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, and we report that, of course, in the peer-reviewed literature, like I just um, noted our paper this year, uh, was peer-reviewed in a high-impact scientific journal. And it's contributing to mercury science and policy through the Park Service and other land managers at the national level. Um, and so we get feedback from park staff, giving us um, their impressions and uh, you know, suggestions for improvement and kind of their thoughts about uh, how the project went. And this is a, kind of an emblematic one. We hear this a lot. They're really surprised and excited at the enthusiasm and curiosity of the students while participating. Students being actively engaged, asking lots of questions, um, how their work would be used for science. Um, and it really is exciting, especially I think to park staff to see people being outdoors and being curious and enjoying doing science and getting their feet literally wet um, and, and capturing insects and getting excited about the whole process. Um, so I'm sure you see that as well at the museum, um, the excitement every day and, and getting people involved in science. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, um, informing policy and management decisions um, is another important goal of the project. The program data are reported back to all of the participating parks and to the National Park Service, of course, who's, who's a partner and a key um, leadership team member on the project. Um, and our co-leads are national level air quality managers and scientists. So the data are going uh, where they can be used. Um, which is which is really important for um, the citizens as well as the science. 
Um, so kind of to sum up, um, the project um, is uh, contributing in thinking about areas of elevated mercury risk um, to guide future research and communicate about risk. Um, it's exciting to have developed and published these uh, integrated benchmarks for potential risk to wildlife and others um, by relating to the fish and other species. Um, and um, the severity of the, and we've of course established the dragonfly protocol um, to use, to, to uh, use dragonfly larvae as biosentinels. We have a published protocol uh, that was developed for a set of Great Lakes region parks who have uh, incorporated this sampling into their yearly monitoring. Um, and as I mentioned, having the baseline data will really help us as we start um, thinking about national and global treaties and uh, regulations that are working to reduce mercury emissions from uh, sources like um, fossil fuel burning, coal-fired utilities uh, around the world. Domestically, uh, mercury is regulated by emission standards for sectors like coal burning utilities, um, but internationally, Mercury is now regulated by a binding global treaty. Um, and last year uh, in around Thanksgiving in Geneva, um, the US is a party to the Minamata Convention on Mercury, which is this globally binding treaty to re reduce mercury um, as a global pollutant. Um, in the US, we have seen reductions in mercury due to the mercury air toxic standards, which were, uh, in effect, and then um, due to some legal challenges are, are no longer uh, upstanding, but other co-reductions from reducing air pollution more generally has resulted in declines in mercury emissions in the US. Um, and so as these reductions um, begin or continue to occur, we hope that these baseline data we've collected and the continued long-term monitoring will let us measure how effective those um, efforts have been or will be. Um, and so we're, we're also working with national monitoring communities now to determine how we can uh, continue to use these biosentinels to assess effectiveness. Um, and I hope I've convinced you of our excitement and commitment to citizen science as a tool to really help us gather needed data across large spatial scales and the benefits to the citizens themselves who have a great time and hopefully learn something new about the natural world. Uh, and I have a photo here from Shenandoah um, from a couple of years ago, one of our longest um, park participants. So it's always great to see um, folks in your area, maybe even some of your neighbors who participated in, in the project. So I could have spent uh, the entire time of this webinar thanking the cast of literally thousands of people who've made this project possible. Uh, again, we're in the 10th year of sampling this year. Um, we have some new partners um, uh, joining us and the big releases of sci the scientific article, uh, others to come. Uh, we have some data visualizations through a story map online that is uh, really neat to click through. Um, and I have the link um, in, the, in the chat, you can put that there, uh, as well as a Facebook page. Um, if you want to keep tabs on the project or learn more. Um, and so with that, I'll say thanks for your interest um, in science and in today's talk. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, so we did have one question here in the chat. Uh, if someone wanted to get involved in the project, how would they do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, currently, the sampling is occurring in national parks. Um, so um, if there's a national park near you or where you plan to go when we're able to maybe travel more freely in the future, um, a good way is to maybe check in with the park um, that you're considering visiting and see if they're um, participating in the project and if they have sort of um, an open, you know, call for participants or maybe it's just a particular school group. So um, getting in touch with the park. Um, you can also 
message us on our Facebook page um, and we will respond if we know of a park near you, if you can send your rough location. Um, much of the sampling for this year is done. It tends to occur kind of during the warm season, at least here in the north, but parks in Florida are yet to sample, for example, where it's warm year round. They, there could still be some sampling events going on um, this winter. This year in particular, though, a lot of parks are uh, really limiting either the group size or some parks, um, each one has their own regulations because of COVID. So some parks are not taking citizen scientists out in the field this year. We hope that uh, we'll be able to do that again next year. Um, but yeah. Okay, so you actually kind of answered another one. Has it been impacted by COVID? It sounds like it has. Uh, so uh, another question here. Um, so currently the Dragonfly Mercury Project is specifically with the National Park Service. Is there any plans to kind of maybe take it outside the National Park Service uh, into other, uh, into other areas? There are, yep. Yeah, that's one of our main um, focal topics right now. We actually convened a steering committee that includes people from multiple other federal agencies, um, as well as academic institution and NGO members. Um, and the goal is to think about how we can expand beyond national parks. Um, I love national parks, one of my favorite places to work, um, but agencies like BLM uh, and the U.S. Forest Service do have um, numerically uh, lots more acres of land that they manage, um, Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well. So we're actively uh, working with that steering committee to figure out how to potentially expand. And this year um, we have a, a few sites in the National Forest um, that are sampling just to pilot that approach as well as BLM out west. Um, and I've worked with a nonprofit to sample some sites that are um, uh, managed by a, a multitude of other um, kind of agencies in, in sort of the NGO world. So um, we're hoping to expand outside parks. That'll give us a broader range of types of landscapes to sample and um, coverage across the country. Yep. Okay, so when you're gathering samples, you're looking at doing it during specific times of the year because the life cycle of the dragonflies, is that correct? That's an interesting question. So um, I had a graduate student who graduated in December who was digging into the question of does it matter what time of year we sample? And she sampled every month of the year at Acadia National Park in Maine. So some months she was digging through the ice um, and there are dragonfly larvae in these water bodies all year round. Um, we can attest even under the ice, they kind of hunker down in the sediment, uh, probably in the winter. Um, and she was, uh, she hasn't published her work yet, but her question exactly was that, does it matter what time of year we sample? Um, often we do tend to sample in the summertime. Um, there are lots of dragonflies around and it's a bit easier sampling as well as more pleasant if you live in a place that has winter. Um, but yeah, so we're just beginning to kind of think about, uh, does the temporal, um, the timing of sampling matter? Uh, so when you're sampling, are you looking to get a specific sample size and what would that sample size be? Yes, so we aim to collect 15, uh, one five individual dragonfly larvae. Um, and that uh, gives us the statistical power to be able to compare among the different sites. Uh, and do you happen to have the Facebook handle for the Dragonfly Mercury Project? I do. It's a long one. Um, and I, it should be up on this slide. So it's Six-Legged Scouts in the National Parks. Okay, Six-Legged Scouts in the National Parks. Yeah, it dates way back to when I had a student who set it up, and we have not changed the name, so. Okay, so I think that's about all the time we have. So on Facebook, Six-Legged Scouts in the National Parks. Also here, I will insert a shameless plug for the museum. Uh, we do also have citizen science projects here at the museum. Uh, so in the past, we had a citizen science project for uh, 
temperature sampling in various areas of Richmond to correlate uh, the amount of vegetation with the perceived temperature. Uh, that one was recently published in the New York Times. And also currently we've got going on air quality sampling. Uh, so definitely do keep an eye on the museum's social media and webpage uh, for when those kinds of opportunities come up if you're interested in doing citizen science. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Nelson, for being with us today and helping us discover more about our world. Please join us next week. This is going to be a very timely one. Uh, Dr. Eric Seymour, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist the National Weather Service, will be with us. He's going to be talking about the 2020 hurricane season, what we've seen so far, and what is still to come. So he's going to be discussing how they model the hurricane season in advance of the season happening, and how the 2020 model is correlating with what we've seen so far in 2020 and what we can still expect. You can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Mm -hmm.